Hello everybody, welcome to my YouTube channel. My name's Kieran, and today we're going to be making a Thunder Warrior for the Unification Wars era of Warhammer 40k. So, a little while ago I was painting up another project, and I was listening to music, and uh, on my playlist came up Manowar and the Conan the Barbarian soundtrack. And that triggered an idea that's been kicking around in the back of my head for a little while. Um, which is to do something related to the Unification Wars uh, for Warhammer 40k. For those of you who don't know, the Unification Wars is where the Emperor of Mankind uh, unified ancient Terra or Earth. I've always been a fan of the old uh, John Blanchard about it, um, and some of which is in the, uh, the you can see it behind me, the uh, Visions of Heresy um, old art book, uh, some wonderful old artwork by John Blanch. Um, it really gives you a sort of feeling of a flavour of this sort of era of 40k. Post-apocalypse, this Mad Max, Fallout style, desert wasteland, atomic wasteland that Earth is becoming this time. And to celebrate that, I'm going to be making a diorama uh, with uh, Thunder Warriors facing off against Techno Barbarians in the ruins of ancient Earth. So in this video, I'm going to be going through how I've gone about converting and painting a Thunder Warrior. So this model is going to be assembled from a few bits from a few different kits and sources. Some of them are GW, uh, others are third party and a few 3D printed bits as well. I'm also going to be doing a decent amount of uh, sculpting with green stuff. For this build I'll be modifying this Imperial Guard head. Uh, this one comes from the old tank upgrade kit they used to get in uh, most of the old guard tank boxes. Um, but there's also a suitable one in the Cadian Heavy Weapons Team kit. Uh, I've chosen the one with the visor because it more closely matches the uh, the sculpt from the Armor of the Ages kit where we first saw Thunder Armor in an actual miniature. Uh, and also a lot of the artwork for the Thunder Warriors. You do only get one head per box though, so if you're going to make a lot like me, then you'll probably want to find a few bits from a bit sellers online or from eBay. Um, when it comes to kit bashing, these services are absolute lifesavers um, because you don't have to spend 30 quid on a single box to get a single bit. So, for the body, I'm going to be using this True Scale Mark II body from Tortuga Bay. I've also used their Mark III bodies because the armor style is pretty similar to the Thunder Warriors and I think variation helps with the overall look of the diorama. Um, I'm also using their True Scale stuff because it's nearly Primaris size uh, and with the Thunder Warriors being larger than normal Astartes, uh, I think the scale works pretty well. So the arms, shoulders and the power pack as well as the weapons uh, they're all going to be 3D printed uh, from STL files that I found online. They're all for free, I'll try and link them in the description. The Proto Bolter is the only thing that I've made myself, uh, which I did uh, by modifying two STL files, kind of just smashing them together uh, in a program called Mesh Mixer. Uh, I might do a video on digital kick bashing in the future if you guys so want, uh, so let me know down below. So, first up in the assembly process is cleanup. Same as you would for any other miniature, uh, get, take your hobby knife uh, or scraper and just lightly scrape off the mold lines just to clean up the mini. The head had a decent amount to clean up, but the Tortuga Bay body uh, had very little other than just the bottom of the feet uh, and the 3D parts of they've already been cleaned up as part of the post process from uh, 3D printing, um, but they generally don't generate mold lines, you just need to take off a few of the supports. Next up is modifying the head. So using a hobby knife uh, or being careful with some clippers, uh, we just try want to take off that front winged skull from the front, um, is it, it doesn't appear on the Thunder Warriors helmets. Um, so you just carefully snip around uh, and take it off. Once it's off, uh, we use a small file to smooth it off and round it out. Um, it doesn't need to be perfect, you just need, need to make sure that it's smooth. Then we just neatly cut off the top knot, uh, make sure the knife is sharp so that it cuts uh, through it without bending that little thin connection part. Then it's just a case of putting a drop of glue in, uh, positioning the hel on the helmet, and then uh, waiting until it's dry. I decided to wait to actually finish this section um, because I want the plume to be um, blowing appropriately for the pose. So onto positioning. Uh, one great way of testing out poses without committing to anything like glue is by using blue tack. So just get little blobs of blue tack on the end uh, and just do a little bit of a dry fit. Now obviously it'll get in the way a little bit, but you can get a decent idea of the pose. Um, with uh, that the pose you want to do with the blue tack uh, and it also simulates green stuff if you need to green stuff anything like that you can simulate it in the blue tack to make sure the positioning is right make sure it's not too bulky
After that, it's just a case of gluing on what you can whilst you can do it. Uh, in this case, I've glued on um, the backpack uh, as well as the arms in a, just a slightly adjusted pose. It's not a lot of gap filling that needs to be done on this miniature, as most of the places that there are gaps are going to be sculpted with green stuff anyway. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to be sculpting some details in with green stuff. The green stuff is a two-part epoxy, uh, also known as kneadertite. Uh, it comes with a yellow part and a blue part. Now you want to knead those together with your fingers um, just to make sure it's then a uniform uh, green all throughout and you know you've mixed it properly. Now when working with green stuff you want to make sure that all your, uh, your tools and your hands are wet. You can do this with either oil or with water um, but you just want to make sure um, that your constantly keeping everything wet just to keep it from sticking to your hands and your tools. You can cause all sorts of horrible issues like tearing or just ruin the work that you've done with it. Um, so throughout all this, uh, I'll just be keeping everything wet to make sure it doesn't stick. A hobby knife, uh, as well as the silicon uh, sculpting tools um, that I bought from Amazon. Uh, they're great in just stopping things from sticking and they also have very shapes and surfaces which is useful for the sculpting process. So for the sculpting process, you just wanna take a little section of your green stuff and just start working it into the part you're working with. Use the tool, keep it wet, even though it is silicon, uh, and just smooth it into uh, all the areas that we want to sculpt. Make sure it's smooth, make sure there's a decent uh, volume there to actually work with, to actually sculpt. Uh, and then once we've neatened all that out and smoothed it, it's then time to start putting the texture on. So with this, I just take the, uh, the pointed coned tool uh, and very carefully start poking in little holes to simulate that chainmail texture. Now you want to be working in rows. Uh, chainmail is made up of small little metal links in a four in one pattern. Uh, so it tends to form small rows. It is a little bit of a tedious process, um, but just be careful. Don't stab too far, don't move it too much and try and keep all the dots uniform and you'll be golden. Now I've just left this for 24 hours just to make sure this green stuff is absolutely fully cured. But once it's cured, it's ready for painting. So now we're on to painting. So the first thing you need to do is prime your miniature. I've gone for a black prime with some zenithal highlighting from above, which I've just done with some black spray all over and then white from above. Just done that with some cheap rattle cans. Then I'm gonna put this onto a painting handle, which I'm gonna fashion from an old Citadel shade pot and a bit of blue tack. So we're just gonna whack that blue tack on from above there and then gently press the model in. You don't wanna to go too hard here, so you don't wanna break it off its base. But once that's been pushed in there, it's solidly on there, it's not going to go anywhere, even if you shake it, drop it, or stab it with a paintbrush. We're then going to go on to the base coating. So we're going to do that with some warp block bronze from Citadel. This is a very dark brass color. Uh, we're going to do that on all of the armor panels, uh, but we're going to avoid the chainmail and the bolt gun for now. We're going to highlight this up with some brass scorpion, which is a lighter bronze paint from Citadel. And we're going to do this with a dry brush or an overbrush, uh, which is a little heavier than a dry brush. So you want to get most of the paint off your dry brush on the kitchen roll there. And then you're going to want to start going over the raised details of the armor. Now you're going to go for 70 to 80% coverage on this. It's going to be the main color with just that warp block bronze hanging out in the details. Once you've finished, it should look something like this. So all those rivets and those ridges have been picked out with a brass scorpion. Now we're just gonna now wash this down with some seraphim sepia. It's gonna bring some uh, additional warmth into the bronze tone there, as well as darkening down those recesses and taking some of the shine out of the chrome finish. And we're gonna go for an aged beaten brass uh, finish, which we're gonna achieve with a sponge, or in my case, a little bit of pluck foam. Once that shade is dry, we're going to then go in with that pluck foam and that brass scorpion color again. And just like the dry brush, you want to get most of that off on your palette until you're left with, when you lightly press it, you get a, a random pattern, like you see there. And then we're just going to gently apply that to the armor all over. And that's what it's going to look like once you finish that section. We 
we're just going to add a bit more weathering here with some rhinox hide it's going to look like splattered mud or potentially uh, deeper older bits of brass Now we're just going to base coat the silver details, uh, like the bolt gun and the chainmail. We're going to do this with just some lead belcher from Citadel, which is just a, a nice dark uh, metal colour. So just apply that to the bolt gun and over the chainmail sections on the legs and on the arm. Then going to shade that down with some Nuln Oil, it's going to give us some nice black shadows. Once the shade is dry, we're then going to go in with the same Pluck Foam method and we're going to use Lead Belcher. This is going to give us a bit of a worn appearance, like things have been dinged or worn away. Then we're going to get go back to our dry brush, add some Troll Slayer Orange to it, and then with a light stippling motion, we're going to apply some Rust. We're then going to go in again with the lead belcher just to give us uh, a few sections where it's been worn back again and that rust has been cut through just to brighten it up a little bit and add some more texture. We're then going to wash that down with some Agrax Earthshade. That's going to give us a sort of oily old metal appearance. We're just going to tie in nicely with a beaten bronze aesthetic. Then we're going to go back in with that with that same lead belcher that we've done previously. Again, just to cut through that and give a little a few spots of shining metal through. Now you can do these weathering steps as many times as you like. Um, each time you're going to add a bit more texture, a bit more, a few more layers. Now I'm just going to add some Brass Scorpion to those details on the bolt gun there just to break it up the section and I'm then going to go back in with a dry brush of orange uh, with a Troll Slayer Orange just to give some nice almost powdery uh, surface rust to there. We're then going to block in the leather details like the gloves with some Rhinox Hide. And then go on to base coat in the face with some Bugman's Glow. I'm going to use a finer brush for this because it's a much finer detail. We're then also going to block in the lenses with some Macrag Blue before washing the whole section down with some Reichland Flesh Shade. Whilst that's drying, we're going to base coat the plume there with some Mephiston Red. Once that's dry, we're then going to shade that down with some Agrax Earth Shade. Then going to take some Kalidor Sky and our fine brush again, and we're just going to highlight up those lenses. Uh, we're just going to keep the darker color just in the corners there. Then going to add a little bit of a, a dot of reflector into the corners, the top corners of the lenses there. Uh, now I didn't record it, but I also put a little bit of a, a rim line around the bottom of the lenses. You want to be very careful with that though. Just going to block in the bottom of the top knot with some black before highlighting up. We're going to do this with some Evil Sun Scarlet, followed then by some Wild Rider Red just on the very edges there. So once you finish up your highlights, this is what it's looking like after all of the acrylics have been applied. Now we're going to add a little bit more weathering and uh, a little bit more washing with some oils. Now don't be scared of oils, they're actually remarkably simple. So we're going to create a verdigris wash for the brass sections, for the bronze. Uh, we're just going to do with some blue, green and a little bit of white to lighten it up as well. We're going to thin all of this down with some odorless mineral spirits. Um, just because it's odorless, do be careful, it still does give off a few fumes. Now just mix that up to the consistency of a wash like you would do for acrylics. Uh, mine is a little bit thick and you can go even thinner on this. Now just apply it to sections where you think that uh, moisture would gather and the verdigris, the, the brass would be aged. 
and then you can add as much or as little because the great thing about washes is you can then take a cotton bud soaked in mineral spirits and just start wiping it away and you can take it off entirely or just leave a little bit it's entirely up to you so don't be scared of oils you can always go back and redo it Now once the oils have dried, uh, you can then go back in and fill a few last details in, like the magazine there and the ribs on the gun. And once that's all done, here he is in his full glory. What do you guys think of him? I'm pretty happy with him, but uh, I might have gone a little bit hard on the uh, on the oils, but you can always take them off a bit later. So let me know in the comments down below what you think. Uh, I'm going to be taking on the Techno Barbarians next time, um, so it might be a quite a lot of kit bashing. So stay tuned for that. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe on the video. Share it with everyone you know. Uh, I'm trying to get this YouTube channel off the ground, so any help you can give is absolutely appreciated. Thank you very much, guys. I'll see you in the next one. Have a good one. Don't forget to eat. Let me know what you think in the, the comments down below. Oh, hello.